So the spectrum of a star is going to tell us the chemical composition, motion, all kind of things. So let's let's tell us, let's look at the spectrum again. Uh, a physicist by the name of Fraunhofer was studying the spectrum of the sun. Now now you know when you put light through a prism, you get this rainbow of colors that came out. But Fraunhofer did something a little bit different. He collimated the light first. In other words, he put the light through a little slit. And so in, uh, the light all came through one part of the prism and spread out. And he noticed there were these certain colors of light that were that looked like they were missing from the spectrum of the sun. Now, we now know that actually where it looks dark, it's just less bright. And and so, uh, but he did he looked at these missing spectral lines, and it was kind of a mystery. Why why did the sun was the sun missing certain colors of light? And uh, you know, if you just do regular light through a prism, you don't see this because it's all the, the effects are smeared out. So you have to really get a very narrow slit going through a prism to see this effect. So the, the uh, spectrum actually tells us a lot of the chemical composition because we talked about that when we talked about emission spectra. Because he realized what was happening was the spectral lines here corresponded to the spectral lines of elements that were studied in the laboratory. So he started matching this up and figuring out some of the chemical composition that made the sun. And this is where an interesting thing happened was when he did this, he realized that we have hydrogen, we have uh, sodium, we have nitrogen, we have this, we have that. But there were also some spectral lines he did not recognize because uh, they had not yet been found on Earth. And so uh, one of the, the, the set of spectral lines that he, they were very obvious in the sun, they're very prominent, so they were a major part of the sun, and he named it after the sun. The Greek for sun is Helios, and so what he discovered was this element that he named helium. Helium turns out to be extremely rare on Earth. It was eventually discovered on Earth, but much later, and is still considered exceedingly rare, exceedingly valuable. Uh, uh, helium by weight actually costs more than gold. And so helium is a very valuable, very rare sort of thing. There's actually less helium on Earth than there is gold, uh, which is odd that we kind of play with it. Now, of course, your helium balloons that you get and play with aren't really pure helium. They just have a tiny bit of helium mixed in with air. Uh, but... But still, helium is, is, is really very rare on Earth, and there's really only about three places it's found in large amounts. Uh, there's some helium found in the Middle East. Uh, there's a f decent amount of helium found in Siberia. There's a little bit found in South Africa. Um, but most of the world's helium is, interestingly enough, found in uh, the Texas panhandle. And so that's where, where most of it is. And you can't make any helium. Uh, you can detonate a hydrogen bomb and make some helium, but that's not a very nice thing to do. And so uh, most of the helium that is out there is trapped underground. It's pumped up with natural gas. It's mixed with the natural gas. And so what they do is they separate it from the natural gas. And that's where almost all, that's where most of the world's helium supply is located. And so it's very, very rare. Uh, helium has certain chemical properties that no other element on Earth has. So that means it's not you can't you cannot just reproduce it with something else or substitute it uh, when you run out. And we are going to eventually run out because uh, we're using it faster, the, the, the you know pretty fast. And then when it gets loose uh, into the atmosphere, it's lighter than air, so it floats to the top of the atmosphere and then leaves. Well, an interesting thing, uh, in the early part of the 20th century, uh, there's a famous uh, American physicist, uh, astrophysicist, Henry Norris Russell, uh, worked up at Harvard, and he was a, a uh, stellar astrophysicist, and, and uh, while he was there, there was this graduate student, Cecilia Payne. Now, now this is actually a big deal, because uh, Cecilia Payne uh, was a graduate student at Harvard, but at the time, Harvard only let men in. Uh, so there was a previous student uh, uh, that, that uh, uh, managed to uh, uh, get into Harvard, Mariah Mitchell, and ironically, as an undergraduate uh, back in the 1800s, it was, it was the first woman admitted to Harvard. 
and uh, she, uh, they didn't actually want her in there, but her dad was a big contributor, and so he pretty much threatened to stop contributing money to them unless they let his daughter uh, take astronomy classes, which she did, and actually exceed, did exceedingly well, with, and, and um, uh, 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 continued, got a graduate degree, then started the entire science program at Vassar College, which was college for women at the time. What well, still is, and and uh, started the science program there. Uh, so one uh, one of the the by, uh, byproducts of her work was that Harvard realized that well women can ex do can do well in 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 science, and so they started admitting a few women into the science programs there because uh, there were very few science programs available uh, at women's colleges. And so one of these early women was Cecilia Payne, and she was studying the spectrum of stars. And what she realized was that possibly all stars were made of the same kind of things with minor details. And so she proposed that stars were mostly made of hydrogen and helium. Now, there's not a huge amount of hydrogen seen in the spectrum of the sun or of other stars, but that was basically uh, what her claim was. Now, Henry Norris Russell, famous astronomer, in fact, he, he's, he was like the premier American astronomer, uh, basically said she didn't know what she's talking about. Okay. Turns out he was wrong. She knew exactly what she was talking about. Uh, stars are mostly made of hydrogen. Uh, the, the thing is that the way that stars work is, the way the spectrum works is you have to be able to see it. So uh, when the light is passing th uh, past the hydrogen, the outer part of the star, it's absorbed if the hydrogen starts in the second energy level and goes to the third, fourth, fifth, or sixth. Okay, it takes more energy to go from the first energy level, and that's, that's amount of energy is basically so much energy, it's beyond visual light, it's ultraviolet light. If the electrons start in the, if the electrons start in the third energy level and go up, that takes so little energy, it's infrared light. But if the electrons start at the second energy level, that means that the amount of light that's absorbed is visual light. Okay, now the problem with this is that if you just have a star the, or any kind of gas, the electrons want to be at the lowest energy level. And so the lowest energy level down here is going to be uh, uh, absorbing ultraviolet light. What she realized was there were a bunch of stars out there with, a, with a gas in low energy levels with ultraviolet spectra, but we did not have the technology to measure the ultraviolet spectra very well. If stars are hotter, the atoms bounce into each other, and when they do, it knocks the electrons to the second energy level. And so that means it's the hot stars that we see with a lot of hydrogen spectral lines, not the, the, the cooler stars. And they're super hot stars, the, electron, the, the atoms bounce together and knock the electrons into third energy level. So when they bounce, go upwards, when they absorb energy, they absorb infrared light, which again, we did not have the ability to detect at that time very well. And so she realized that the temperature of the star was a major factor in why you saw hydrogen. It was not that the hydrogen was a different comp composition in the star. Uh, so that was, that was her realization. And in fact, when we do study the sun, we find that a little over 90% of the sun is in fact hydrogen. And about 9% is, is helium. And about 0.1% is everything else. Now, your book will say about 69% of the sun is, is hydrogen and about almost 28% is helium. The difference is that that is measuring it by mass, whereas the numbers I gave you at first were by number of atoms. So what's the difference? Well, hydrogen is the lightest gas. Helium weighs four times as much. So even though it's a much smaller percentage, then it still, it, it still weighs quite a bit. So, so uh, uh, over a fourth of the sun is, is helium by mass, 
but a little less than 10% is helium by number of atoms. And so this turns out to be a similar composition, really, for practically all stars. For physicists, since 99 point something percent of the star is hydrogen and helium, then uh, all these other elements have a lot of electrons in them, and so they're difficult to describe mathematically if you really get into the physics of how atoms work. And so uh, anything with lots of electrons in physics we call a metal. So phys uh, astronomers call everything other than hydrogen and helium metals. So we have hydrogen, helium, and metals. Metals make up a tiny, tiny fraction of the star. So that if you understand the physics of how hydrogen and helium works, you understand how stars work. So the metals are just like contamination that's in there. 